Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Health Reform for Ombudsman Conference Call. During the presentation, all, par all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Afterwards, we'll conduct a question and answer session. At that time, if you have a question, please press a 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone. If you need to reach an operator at any time, please press star 0. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded Wednesday, April 7, 2010. I would now like to turn the conference over to Lori Smetanka. Please go ahead. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. This is Lori Smetanka, and I'm the director of the National Long-Term Care Ombudsman Resource Center, and I'd like to thank you for joining today's call. We planned this call today because the recent passage of the health reform legislation, inside of the legislation, there are a number of provisions, many of which have been worked on for a number of years that could directly affect your work as ombudsman and the individuals that you assist on a daily basis. So we believe that this call is the first step in getting a handle on the newly passed legislative provisions. And we at the Resource Center will be conducting additional opportunities in the future for sharing information and resources as the different parts of the legislation get implemented. But we wanted to start having a conversation and an introductor, introduction to the different provisions that passed in the final legislation. So today we've pulled together an outstanding group of national experts to lead us through some of the pertinent parts of the legislation that passed. Joining us today are Brian Lindbergh, Executive Director of the Consumer Coalition for Quality Healthcare and a consultant with the National Association of State Ombudsman Programs, Janet Wells, Nick Nurse Director of Public Policy, Jean Coffey, Staff Attorney with the National Senior Citizens Law Center, and Vicki Gottlich, Senior Policy Attorney for the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Also joining and, in, and adding some information and responding to some questions will be Gail McGinnis, who also works with the Consumer Coalition for Quality Healthcare. Um, prior to today's call with the call-in number, you did receive via email some handouts that the speakers will be referencing today. Those materials will also be available on the center website after the call um, so that you can reference them in the future. And with that, I'm going to turn the call over to Brian. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Lori, for including me in today's uh, discussion on health care reform. Uh, suffice it to say that this will be um, one of many on this topic uh, in conferences, webinars. Uh, uh, the analyses will go on for years to come. Uh, but the first step for many of us um, that we've taken in this process is actually to celebrate um, there have been a lot of um, gatherings in D.C. over the last couple uh, weeks, and uh, a lot of people, um, you know, really are looking at this as an occasion that deserves some celebration and also some reflection. Um, it's historic in its nature in a sense that um, we now join most other post-industrial nations in attempting to provide health care to the entire population. It's uh, also a personal milestone for me and many of um, our uh, peers here in D.C. working on aging and health care issues and around the country, uh, many people having worked on these issues since they were in college or when they started their careers. It's uh, historic in another way. Although many uh, uh, the pundits doubted that health care reform would uh, address long-term care or long-term supports and services, as many call it now, um, it did address long-term care in ways that many uh, will may have um, some very lasting effects. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how um, and if the politics and misinformation were historic, um, but there will be a lasting ramification, I believe, um, from this new law on politics. The process and the content of the new law will be discussed and evaluated and used in the political campaigns for some time to come. The effectiveness of Congress could be altered as a result of the hard feelings uh, that were created during the last year or so about the process and the success of the Democrats um, in passing such a huge uh, change in our society. A um, <clears throat> number of very big questions um, are yet to be answered uh, on the politics of things. Will Republicans cooperate on other issues this year and beyond? And if not, how will the Democrats respond now and when they're in the minority? How effective will the Republicans be in using this issue against um, 
their competition to gain seats in Congress, and what will that mean for the future of health care reform? And will there be a serious effort to repeal the Health Care Reform Act, and will this be the foundation for Republicans or independents gaining seats, or will it, um, will it turn out to be um, uh, maybe a backfire and, and actually help Democrats if they believe Republicans or independents were trying to obstruct here? Um, moving forward, before the celebrations end, we all have been spending a great bit, uh, did a, a bit of time on, um, in the last weeks, analyzing the new law and sharing this information with one another. And you have some of that work, and we'll continue to share that um, in the weeks ahead. Uh, the other task we um, have turned to involves the implementation of the law. It will be necessary over the next months and years to work with advocates to weigh in on the many regulations and advisory panel appointments and rulemaking which the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, and the Secretary of Health and Human Services um, are responsible for. Today we hope to add some clarity on key issues and provisions affecting older and disabled individuals. I'm going to start us off on that by briefly describing some of the provisions in the new law that came from the Elder Justice Act. And let, remi let me remind you of some of the key members in Congress that made that all happen, uh, particularly Senator, Lincoln's, uh, Senator Lincoln and Senator Hatch. Um, I think they played probably the largest roles. Uh, Senators Grassley and Baucus, also the uh, ranking minority member and uh, mid, um, chairman of the Finance Committee, and in the House, uh, Representatives King, Schakowsky, Sestak, and uh, we can't forget uh, former Representative Rahm Emanuel, who now is Chief of Staff in the White House, but he was one of the original um, sponsors of the legislation. So the health care reform um, bill, H.R. 3590, which became public law 111-148, that's, that's the 111 stands for the 111th Congress, the 148th um, law out of that Congress, contains um, most of the Elder Justice Act it was, as it was introduced in the 111th Congress um, in both the House and the Senate. It establishes a number of uh, critical um, uh, new programs. First, it, it creates um, the Elder Justice Coordinating Council to make recommendations to the Secretary of Health and Human Services on the coordination of activities of both federal, state, local, private agencies, and entities related to elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. So it's a concrete this coordinating council will have a comprehensive look at all that's going on um, in the United States, and it will report back um, in two years on um, what, the, what the status um, is um, for elder abuse in the country and what its additional recommendations are. The legislation also provides $400 million over four years in the first time dedicated funding for adult protective services. Um, we don't know right now how that will be distributed um, within HHS. It provides $100 million for state demonstration grants to test a variety of methods to detect and prevent elder abuse. It provides $26 million for the establishment and support of an elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation uh, forensic centers around the country. It provides national training, a national training institute funds for surveyors, and it provides $32.5 million in grants to support the long-term care ombudsman program and an additional $40 million in training programs for national organizations and state long-term care ombudsman programs. And I should add at this point that these provisions have a long history um, with NASOP and NICNR. Uh, we've been working to secure those since the beginning um, when the bill was first drafted more than seven years ago. Uh, the bill also authorizes $67.5 million in grants to enhance long-term care staffing through training and recruitment and incentives for individuals seeking or maintaining employment in long-term care. Um, this was a provision that um, became a part of a deal that 
a number of groups um, secured, and that's something that the the um, <clears throat> long-term care nursing home industry supported. Uh, for fiscal year 2011, which starts this coming October, October 1st, the bill authorizes a total of $195 million for all these programs I've mentioned. Um, the total um, authorization lasts four years. So let me jump into what we we're looking at this year in terms of the appropriations um, process. So first, we all need to keep in mind that the new law authorizes Congress to spend these funds for these programs I've mentioned, but that that's the, just the first step. Congress must now appropriate the funds, and we all know that the government is basically broke, and that the president um, submitted in his budget this year a freeze on domestic spending. That freeze doesn't affect um, the Veterans Administration, the Department of Defense, or the Department of Homeland Security. Um, but the freeze is not a hard freeze either. Um, that means that HHS was actually given um, a significant increase this year, but there will be tough competition between the many programs within HHS, um, new programs like the elder just, justice programs we're talking about, and also old programs that are vying for increases for their current um, allocations. The long-term care ombudsman program and the resource center, I think, are in a good position to compete for funding um, for both providing more services to address elder abuse in long-term care facilities and for training ombudsmen to address um, elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. Those FY 2011 um, numbers are $5 million and $10 million respectively. And the, again, those are the authorization levels. The Elder Justice Coalition, um, which many of you know, um, uh, NASOP was one of the five founding members of the coalition, and Nickner is um, a key member as well, um, has been working on how to handle this uh, health care reform legislation passage, which passed after the president submitted his budget and after some of the committee work has been done along um, appropriations lines. But we are now working on communications with Congress, um, and the request that we are advocating is the full $195 million for the Elder Justice Act programs for FY 2011. Um, we are both thanking um, members of Congress, those who, who voted for the bill, for passage of health care reform and asking them now to add their already, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, add to their already developed list of priorities funding for the elder justice programs um, because of the unique timing of passage and signing of the bill. We're asking for full funding because it is what Congress has authorized and the appropriations committees will now have to weigh this program against other programs when they determine their priorities for this coming year. It didn't seem to make sense to us to send in a request that already undermined what was just authorized by the new law. So you'll be hearing from us at some point soon asking you all to weigh in with members of Congress as well in supporting, in supporting this funding request. So um, let me wrap up now, and again, um, I'd be happy to answer questions uh, at the end, but uh, again, let me thank you for including me today, and I'm going to turn this over to Janet Wells to talk about other important long-term care and nursing home-related provisions, many of which uh, she was instrumental in securing in the new law. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, as Brian said, uh, it's been a long time for this bill. Um, I think we named our annual meeting for the Elder Justice Act in 2003, and every year since then I've been saying this is the year we're passing Elder Justice, and we really did it. It's, it's almost a shock to realize that uh, we finally have this legislation. I'll mention one other provision in the Elder Justice Act that um, I don't think Brian did mention, and that there is um, in it a uh, mandatory reporting requirement of anyone work, uh, owner or operator or anyone working in a long-term care facility that receives at least $10,000 in federal funds. So that would uh, cover uh, community-based facilities as well. 
uh, would be re required to report um, suspected abuse or neglect to local authorities and also uh, to the state uh, within uh, two hours uh, if there is a concern of that uh, bodily harm has occurred or, or 24 hours uh, otherwise. There are penalties in the law for failure to report of up to $200,000. And if uh, harm occurs to a resident of a facility as a result of failure to report, the penalties are increased. Uh, there also is protection uh, against retaliation for uh, employees who report uh, uh, neglect or abuse. Um, Uh, moving in tandem for the last few years with the Elder Justice Act has been uh, a criminal background check provision sponsored by Senator Cole of Wisconsin uh, to extend, um, I think it was in 2003 that uh, the patient, uh, patient uh, protect protection and uh, abuse prevention act uh, was originally uh, the, the bill was, re I'm sorry, originally introduced about 12 years ago. In 2003, it passed uh, as a demonstration program. I believe there were about six states, and some of you are probably from those states, that participated in the demonstration. Uh, the health care reform law now extends that uh, law uh, to all states. Uh, uh, states will enter into a, an agreement with HHS to uh, operate at uh, criminal background check programs on all long-term care workers. So this applies not only to nursing homes and to other facilities, but also to home care workers. Uh, uh, there's a lot of state discretion in here, and I'm sure we'll be talking more about this uh, as we move forward and also be interested in hearing from pe people who are in the pilot states about their experiences in the implementation of the law. But it, uh, it will require uh, for new employees that there be uh, fingerprinting, a state and national uh, background checks, both into FBI and police records and other such records as the uh, state Medicaid fraud control units, units and state professional licensing and disciplinary boards. Uh, we'll uh, be putting some more information about this on our website. And I do want to mention that Nickner uh, has begun putting up information about the health care reform law. Uh, not only about the uh, provisions that we are most specifically concerned with, but also about the entire law. And we are putting links on our website to sources that we think have, uh, have done a good job of explaining some of these provisions. So uh, please uh, keep watching our website for uh, information. We have uh, put up today uh, a grid that lays out the provisions in the nursing home transparency and. Uh, Improvement Act that was folded into the health care reform bill. This is uh, a bill that I'm sure you know we've been working on for about three years now. Uh, began uh, really a debate in Congress when the uh, Medicare chain was taken over by the Carlisle Group, the uh, private equity investment firm. And uh, as, as a result, we have one of the um, you know, most extensive nursing home reform bills we've had since OVRA passed in 1987. The uh, highlight of the bill, I guess, is the uh, disclosure of ownership and other uh, disclosable parties in the bill. This was the primary purpose of the bill, uh, to make nursing homes disclose who their own, not only who their owners are, but also all those people in the ch and, and entities in the chain of operations, their boards, their subsidiaries, their partners, um, all those groups that have often been hidden uh, that have kept people from really evaluating and not only kept individual consumers and ombudsmen, but also have kept uh, even uh, regulatory and enforcement agencies from follow, uh, identifying patterns of poor care, patterns of problematic ownership of facilities. This uh, provision uh, we had concerns that uh, the provision uh, would be substantially weakened uh, during the uh, congressional process. Um, it, it really was not. It's almost intact from when it was originally introduced. I think one thing we left was some of the financing parties uh, 
in in the nurse in sort of the, in the the entities that lend money uh, to um, nursing homes and to corporations. Uh, not all of those are disclosed. That seemed to be the main sticking point for the industry. But there is still, uh, if you will look at the chart on our website, um, still um, really a great deal of uh, disclosure now about all these interlocking groups that oper operate nursing homes, in including owning the real estate. Uh, one of the, uh, I guess there's some things in here we're underwhelmed about. Uh, I guess one that we feel like we're remain, it remains to be seen, whether it's effective, is the requirement that uh, nursing home organizations, uh, the entities that operate nursing homes, establish compliance and ethics programs where they are in, uh, have an internal system, internal uh, officers appointed to um, uh, police their own compliance and their own quality of care. I think I haven't compared this to the requirements for corporate integrity and agreements that many corporations have operated under under during the last decade or so, but I think this is a similar process. Um, I understand that the Inspector General's office uh, is very high on this provision uh, and thinks it's, it will be effective. Uh, I'm not sure that the corporate integrity agreements have been based on the OIG's own, uh, own uh, evaluation in the last year or two of that program. Uh, but I think it's, it's one of those things, um, as Brian said, a lot is going to be done in the implementation, and I think uh, in spite of some skepticism, we'll be working to see if that can be made into an effective program. Uh, the HHS, the Department of Health and Human Services, also will establish um, quality assurance and improvement programs for nursing homes, um, it, uh, establishing quality assurance and performance standards and providing them with technical assistance. Again, this seems to, to mirror the work of the Office of Inspector General and some of the technical assistance that it's given to the nursing home chains in particular in recent years. Uh, one of the other really, the things that consumers will notice, and, uh, and these provisions take effect in one year from now, is the changes on the Nursing Home Compare web website. Uh, as you know, for well over a decade now, uh, Nickner has advocated for, um, actually for well over 20 years, Nickner has advocated for a minimum staffing standards in nursing homes. It's been impossible to move that forward on the federal level, but uh, for the last decade, CMS has been developing a system where it at least could collect and report accurate, meaningful data to consumers. So uh, st uh, starting in March 2012, it should have a system in place, uh, which it's already developed actually, that will collect uh, nurse, nurse staffing and other staffing data directly from payroll records, and uh, which will enable CMS to report that data by, uh, by hours per resident day and to to report turnover and retention rates. So this will be uh, great uh, quality information that's the, um, I think we all know that the staffing data that we have now uh, that's reported on Nursing Home Compare is self-reported and uh, often very, very inaccurate. Um, so that uh, when this is implemented, people will have a much better sense of the quality of staffing in nursing homes. And we hope at least that it will be an incentive for nursing homes to do a better job of um, staffing and that also uh, that it will be an incentive to nursing homes um, and that it will be uh, an incentive to the government uh, to um, finally establish nurse staffing ratios. Uh, there will be uh, links to state websites. States will are to set up websites that include um, much more information than is now available, uh, including uh, posting the Form 2567 inspection reports online and uh, guidance to consumers on how to interpret them. Also, uh, plans of correction and other responses to surveys. So, uh, yeah, I personally think that uh, there's no substitute for actually seeing an inspection report and what the findings in the survey were. Um, and uh, there again, uh, that is to be um, implemented uh, by uh, this time next year. There is a provision uh, for creation of a standardized complaint form 
that could be used for filing complaints either with the state survey agency or with the ombudsman program. It's a voluntary uh, uh, form. Uh, the advocate for this is a woman in Michigan who, uh, after her, I believe it was her aunt, was um, suffered neglect in a nursing home, felt that having a standardized complaint form was uh, would be an effective way to um, help people um, articulate complaints. And so she got this passed in Michigan and then got her senator to introduce it in the Senate, uh, Senator Stabenow. Um, the uh, Nursing Home Compare will have a copy of the standardized complaint form on the website with instructions on how to use it. And also uh, added to Nursing Home Compare will be a summary of the number, type, severity, and outcome of su substantiated complaints. Also, on Nursing Home Compare will uh, now be included adjudicated criminal violations by a facility or its employees. There is a provision in the law to uh, conduct a study of Nursing Home Compare and to uh, determine whether um, it is uh, readable, understandable, and how it could be improved. And that study um, is also supposed to move forward expeditiously. And there's also a requirement for increasing the timeliness of submission of survey information. States will be required to submit survey information to CMS no later than the date that they send it to nursing facilities to keep Nursing Home Compare updated on a more timely basis. There is uh, now a, a provision in law. It currently has just been in policy and practice for a special focus facility program. And um, there is now, uh, as of March 2011, uh, nursing homes will re be required to make their uh, survey reports in, uh, available for the past three years um, available to uh, anyone who asks for them. Uh, that includes both their annual survey reports and uh, complaint investigations. Uh, there is a provision that they can't make any information of, uh, available that would identify a complainant. And again, uh, as I said, there is uh, now uh, will be a requirement for states to maintain uh, websites that provide information about uh, nursing homes, including the 25. 67 inspection reports, complaint investigation reports, plans of correction, and other information. Um, there is also um, a new provision for uh, developing uh, a system to categorize expenditures by their uh, the type of expenditure and to establish procedures to make information available to anyone who requests it. Uh, that shows how spending is broken down uh, by the facility, including uh, spending on direct care services, including nursing therapies and medical services, spending on indirect care, including housekeeping and dietary, capital aspect, uh, assets, including building and land cost, and administrative services cost. Uh, this will be another, uh, offer additional information on how uh, to help consumers uh, look at where uh, nursing homes and nursing home chains hopefully uh, choose to put their funding. Uh, there is also a requirement for states to establish uh, or improve their complaint resolution processes, including procedures to assure accurate tracking of complaints, uh, to determine the severity of the complaints, and to um, established deadlines for responding to complaints. And there is uh, a provision uh, to uh, assure that um, legal representatives of residents and other responsible parties are not denied access to residents or retaliated against if they complain about quality of care and other issues. There is a provision that the nursing home industry asked for, a kind of last minute provision for a GAO study of the five star quality rating system. Uh, I'll, there also was a request in the House, although it was not in the House bill, for a GAO study of the, of the rating system. As you know, uh, much of the industry has been vehemently opposed to the um, five star rating system, but uh, we're not 
too concerned about the study because, one, we, I think consumers also believe that uh, there are improvements that need to be made in the system, but also that GAO has been very objective and fair in looking at um, issues in the past. An area that we were a lot more excited about when this bill was first introduced, we now have some concerns about. And I want to uh, just take a minute here to say again, Anything in the legislation that raises questions that you don't understand probably is something uh, that needs to be addressed in regulations, uh, something that has left questions hanging uh, about implementation. And um, I, CMS has said they're going to be moving very, very fast to develop proposed regulations. And that means that uh, consumer Advocates are going to have to move very, very fast to respond to those regulations. There's going to be a lot of it. And you're the people with the expertise. And uh, your input on the proposed regulations is going to be really, really important. So we'll be calling on you and uh, certainly hoping to hear from you as you begin to look at the provisions in the bill, bill and any questions uh, that we're not able to answer today. Uh, please, um, please, please be prepared to uh, give me a call or send me an email uh, to let me know about your concerns so we can begin to think about those and address those in proposed regulations. Uh, so anyway, um, I just wanted to focus on the uh, provision that's called targeting enforcement. Uh, it had two main purposes when it was first introduced. One was to increase the amount of federal penalties. It would have been the first increase in federal penalties in um, since OBRA was in, uh, passed in 1987. Uh, those, uh, both bills, uh, both the House and Senate bills, increased the civil monetary penalties when the bills were first introduced. Um, they were still in the House bill uh, the beginning of this year and were in the bill that uh, passed the House. But as you know, we lost the House legislation uh, when the uh, uh, we lost the uh, 60 vote majority in the Senate, uh, we got the result of the process that then followed was that we got the Senate bill. And so we therefore lost the increase in civil monetary penalties that we might have gotten in negotiations between the House and Senate if we had had an actual negotiation of provisions in those bills. So now there is no increase. Um, the other provision was to escrow uh, civil monetary penalties uh, while nursing homes appeal. Uh, we know that nursing homes are prone to appeal any deficiency and that uh, we know from work done by the Center for Medicare Advocacy that they virtually always lose their appeals when they go to a, uh, an administrative law judge or a departmental appeals board. Hardly, very rarely are deficiencies upheld, but that long delay does mean that sometimes the CMPs are never paid. The uh, provision is there. Um, uh, escrow, for escrowing of CMPs. However, there has to be an independent informal dispute resolution process before the money can be escrowed. And we're concerned about that. We've talked to some uh, of our members, uh, including some of you who may be on the call today, who have a system that actually is working. Um, you have an independent IDR system already, and uh, those uh, appeals of uh, Usually, usually the violations are upheld or they're more likely to be upheld in that independent, independent process uh, than they are in a facility level IDR. So uh, we're very concerned um, that the regulations be really, really strong on this uh, process, that we look at states where independent IDR is working, where you have an independent group, that it really is independent. Uh, Representative Waxman, uh, read language, uh, uh, put language into the report on the bill um, specifying that it, there be no conflicts of interest and, and other provisions that we hope will be in regulations to assure that this is going to be an independent process and uh, we don't get um, a, a process where surveyors are intimidated. Um, there was a GAO report in December saying that in uh, some in four states that they looked at, the surveyors felt that the IDR process um, uh, had been used to intimidate surveyors or reduce the amount of penalties. So um, I would very, very much like to hear from people uh, who 
have uh, an independent IDR process already in your states about what is what works and what doesn't work about that process. Um, Moving on, uh, there is also a provision for a national independent monitor demonstration project. This is something else that got watered down as the legislation moved along. Uh, nursing home ch it was designed to uh, determine what an effective uh, way of monitoring large nursing home chains. Um, still, still does that, but the chains have to apply to participate in the demonstration. Um, so it, it's kind of hard to see why they would uh, volunteer. Um, one other provision, uh, notification of facility closure. This uh, will certainly involve the ombudsman. Uh, ombudsman, uh, the nursing homes will have to uh, give 60 days notice. Nursing homes will have to give 60 days notice uh, before a voluntary closure. Uh, they will have to notify CMS, the, the state ombudsman, and also the residents and their representatives and responsible parties. Uh, and this is only in cases of voluntary closure. Uh, CMS will still retain discretion in uh, cases where um, uh, it, it is, uh, has terminated Medicare and Medicaid. A couple of important things about this is that the language does state that uh, the quality of services and the location of services have to be taken in, into consideration. There also has to be consideration of re relocating to a home and community-based setting and uh, an important provision is that CMS will have the discretion to continue uh, Medicare and Medicaid payments for residents uh, un until uh, all the residents are successfully relocated. Right now, the termination of uh, funds after 30 days has been a critical problem in some states. So uh, one other final provision, uh, the initial 75 hours of nurse aid training will now have to include dementia management and patient abuse prevention training. So um, after other pre presenters uh, have completed, I'll be glad to take questions and also we'll be glad to hear from you uh, by phone or email. So I'd like to turn it over to uh, Jean Coffey now with the National Senior Citizens Law Center to talk about home and community-based provisions. Thank you, Janet. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, as Janet said, my name is Gene Coffey, and I'm going to talk about the uh, Medicaid long-term care provisions of the Patient Protection Act, or as I'll refer to during the, my talk, just the, the Patient Act for brevity. Uh, there is lots of good stuff in here, as the Act uh, contains several important additions to Medicaid's uh, long-term care program. Um, and, and before I actually um, describe what is in uh, the Patient Act, I just want to step back and first um, just briefly uh, present the framework of, of uh, Medicaid's traditional long-term care coverage just so uh, everybody understands uh, just how important the provisions that were included in the Patient Act uh, are. So, uh, as many of you know, or as most of you, if not all of you know, Medicaid um, is the single largest purchaser of long-term services in the nation. Uh, this is because of the very high cost of the services generally needed by individuals who have chronic conditions and require the regular assistance of other individuals, coupled with the at least heretofore absence of traditional insurance coverage for those services. Uh, for starters, Medicare's coverage for individuals with chronic conditions, generally speaking, is not long-term or designed for individuals who have less than an acute condition. Uh, private insurance is an option, but it's simply cost prohibitive for many individuals. And while all of us will now have the option to enroll in the class program, uh, the program hasn't begun yet and no one is going to receive coverage through it for at least five years. So, for those who cannot afford the services on their own, Medicaid is the most common source of coverage and uh, uh, will be for some time in the future. But as important as Medicaid's coverage is, there is one big drawback about it, and that is that the framework of Medicaid is such that it's easier for an individual with a chronic condition to receive coverage if he or she is in a nursing home than if he or she is not. Well, why is this so? Well, uh, virtually every state has a clinical eligibility standard for Medicaid coverage of long-term services. If an individual meets that standard 
and meets Medicaid's financial eligibility requirements, he or she will be guaranteed coverage for nursing facility services if the individual enters a facility. But what if an individual who meets Medicaid's clinical eligibility standard for long-term care doesn't want to go into a facility? Well, states can offer a package of community-based services to these individuals through Medicaid waiver programs, but federal law prohibits states from spending more on their HCBS waiver programs than they do on nursing facility services. Now, there are some services that states can offer to their Medicaid populations outside of waiver programs that do not have financial caps, such as home health services and personal care services. However, while the federal law doesn't limit how much states can spend for coverage of home health services or personal care services, some states try to restrict coverage for these services anyway because they are expensive for states to cover and, as we all know, state budgetary pressures can impact the scope of a state's Medicaid program. Uh, the ultimate result of the structure is that Medicaid spending on institutional services for individuals with chronic needs dwarfs Medicaid spending for community-based care. Uh, overall, for example, in 2007, uh, uh, only 12 states directed as much as 25% of their Medicaid spending towards community-based care for Medicaid enrollees with long-term care needs. Um, the big problem with this is that, or there are two problems. First, many of these individuals being served would prefer to be in their homes or other community settings than in nursing homes. And second, serving individuals in facilities is actually more expensive for states. And with the older population, at least, growing substantially in numbers, what we're looking at in the absence of any change is growing numbers of unhappy consumers and unhappy states. Well, the Patient Act contain some very attractive strategies for addressing this problem. First, authorized by the Patient Act is a new program called the State Balancing Incentive Program. Now, under this program, any state that is currently directing less than 50% of their Medicaid LTC dollars towards community-based care can apply to the federal government for qualification as a balancing incentive state under which the state will receive an increase in their federal reimbursement rate for community-based services if they present a satisfactory plan to the federal government outlining how they intend to expand their community-based options. States that are currently spending less than 25% of their Medicaid LTC dollars on community-based care will receive a 5 percentage point increase in their federal Medicaid reimbursement rate for the community-based LTC services they deliver under the program, uh, and, and states that are spending between 25% and 50% on community-based services currently uh, will be eligible for a two percentage point increase in their reimbursement rate. Uh, the balancing incentive period will run from October 1st, 2011 to September 30th, 2015, so CMS will probably soon circulate to state Medicaid agencies invitations to apply uh, for qualification as the balancing incentive state, and, and I should point out there is no limit on, on the number of states that can qualify. A second item that's included in the Patient Act is the new community-based attendance service option. Now, as I mentioned before, states generally have a clinical eligibility standard for Medicaid coverage of LTC that qualifies an individual for either nursing facility coverage or HCBS waiver coverage. The community-based attendance service option that's been added by the Patient Act will create a third option for individuals meeting this standard, and it will provide states, just as we saw with the balancing incentive program, a financial incentive to provide coverage for it. A state that agrees to adopt this uh, new service into their Medicaid program will receive a six percentage point reimbursement rate increase for services delivered through this option. Additionally, there will be no cap on the amount a state spends for coverage of this service, nor is there a time limit in the law on the reimbursement rate increase the states will receive for adopting the option. Now, the community-based uh, attendance service option will include, very broadly, the intended services necessary, and I'm, I'm reading almost straight from the statute, uh, necessary to insist, or to uh, not insist, assist, 
an individual with activities of daily living or instrumental activities of daily living. Uh, states will be authorized to uh, begin providing coverage for this option in October of 2011. The, the original uh, Patient Act that was enacted um, in March um, uh, provided states the authority to um, uh, provide coverage for this option beginning in October of this year. But the Reconciliation Act, which was a, a, a minor sort of fix bill, I, I, it wasn't minor in, in its importance, but it, it wasn't as expansive in, it, in its scope as the Patient Act, and it was passed a, a week after the Patient Act, made some uh, modifications to the overall health care uh, reform bill, and, and that was one of them. The, the delay until October of 2007 uh, for the state authority to provide coverage for this new Medicaid uh, attendant service option. Uh, a third feature of the law is an enhancement of the Medicaid HCBS state plan option. Uh, now, for Medicaid enrollees who have chronic needs but do not have needs that rise to the level of the state's Medicaid LTC clinical eligibility standard, these individuals generally cannot receive a package of community-based services through a Medicaid waiver because waivers require that the enrollees meet the higher clinical standard. A few years ago, however, Congress added the Home and Community-Based Services State Plan benefit to the Medicaid program, and it authorized states to offer a package of HCBS to individuals who have levels of need lower than a state's Medicaid LTC clinical eligibility standard. Now, up to this point, only four states have adopted the option, Iowa, Nevada, Colorado, and Washington. And one of the problems with the original design of this benefit was that it limited the number of services that a state could offer individuals eligible for the benefit. Well, the Patient Act eliminates this restriction, and it will allow states to offer eligible individuals uh, as many services as the state wants to offer in the benefit, so long as CMS approves the inclusion of the services that a state chooses. Additionally, the Patient Act authorizes states to carve into their Medicaid programs an exclusive eligibility category for individuals who are eligible for the HCBS state plan benefit. Now, to better understand why this may be an advantage to both states and, and prospective HCBS state plan uh, recipients, uh, I, I refer you to the discussion uh, of the HCBS state plan benefit in an issue brief that, that I um, uh, sent to Lori about an hour ago to circulate to everybody on the call. Uh, and unfortunately, I, I didn't get it to Lori uh, soon enough to, um, to include in the original or initial package she, she sent out. But if you, if you want to, uh, again, understand uh, more about this new potential uh, at state option um, categorical eligibility group, uh, there, there's a discussion in the uh, issue brief uh, about it. There's unfortunately just a level of complication attached to it that would probably take a little bit more time than, than we uh, have today. Uh, two other things I just want to highlight about the Patient Act include the expansion of the spousal impoverishment protections, the mandatory extension of those protections to HCBS waiver enrollees, and the reauthorization of the Money Follows the Person program. Uh, with regard to spousal impoverishment protections, if, if you don't already know, uh, these protections uh, in the federal law guarantee that the spouse of a Medicaid-enrolled nursing facility resident be allowed to keep for his or her own community needs a minimum amount of the couple's combined assets and a minimum amount of the couple's combined income. These asset and income shares that the quote-unquote community spouse is entitled to are adjusted each year, and for 2010, the community spouse is entitled to keep at least approximately $1,800 of the couple's combined income. It's a little bit more than that, and again, that's the minimum, and at least $21,000 of the couple's combined assets or half of the couple's assets, whichever is greater, up to a maximum of $109,000, again, for 2010. However, while these protections must be uh, extended to community spouses of Medicaid enrolled nursing facility residents, states do not have to offer the same protections to spouses of HCBS waiver enrollees. The problem with this is that it essentially creates an incentive for a frail spouse to enter a nursing facility in order to get coverage for services he or she needs without having to impoverish the couple in order to get the coverage. Well, the Patient Act mandates 
that states extend the spousal impoverishment protections to the spouses of HCBS waiver enrollees. Now, this is a very important improvement to Medicaid's LTC coverage. Unfortunately, the requirement does not go into effect until January 1, 2014. Now, I should say that some states have opted to extend the protections to the spouses of their HCBS waiver enrollees, but they're not required to. And beginning in 2014, uh, all states that are operating HCBS waiver programs must ex uh, extend the protections to the spouses of the waiver enrollees. And finally, uh, the Patient Protection Act uh, extends funding for the Money Follows the Person program through 2016. Uh, a few years ago, Congress authorized this program, the Money Follows the Person program, uh, that provides uh, additional federal financial assistance to states over what the states receive uh, through their federal Medicaid reimbursement rate for state efforts to transition Medicaid-enrolled institutionalized residents back to their homes or other community settings. Uh, 31 states received approval to participate in the program, which began in 2007, uh, but federal funding for the program was auth authorized only through the end of the uh, 2011 fiscal year, and what Congress did in the Patient Act was extend authorization for funding through the end of the 2016 fiscal year. Additionally, the Patient Act modified uh, a central eligibility requirement for MFP participation. Uh, originally, MFP participation uh, was limited to individuals who had been in the facility for at least six months, with states having the option to impose a longer minimum stay of up to two years. Uh, but in the Patient Act, uh, Congress modified this requirement to make eligible any Medicaid-enrolled institutionalized individual who has been in a facility for 90 days and, and remove state authority to impose a longer minimum stay. Uh, the one thing that is not clear right now is whether the extension of, of funding for the program will mean that CMS will call for a new round of state proposals for state participation or whether states already participating will simply continue to receive the um, additional uh, financial support um, through uh, uh, that year. Uh, but regardless, uh, that's, that's the summary of the Medicaid LTC provisions of the Patient Act, which, again, on the whole, significantly improved the structure of Medicaid's LTC coverage and, and provides some critical financial incentives uh, for states to adopt many of these new options. So that's my overview. Uh, please feel free to shoot me emails if, if you have any questions about these uh, provisions. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Vicki Gottlich. Hi, I'm Vicki Gottlich at the Center for Medicare Advocacy, and I get to talk about Medicare. I'm talking about Medicare and health care reform is fun because I could spend almost my whole allotted time debunking all the myths that everybody has heard about um, health care reform and Medicare. Um, I've taken to starting presentations by saying there are no death panels um, for Medicare beneficiaries in health care reform because um, that's symbolic of the misinformation that people have had. So I want to talk a little bit about um, the overall changes to Medicare, and then I want to call your attention to a few provisions that um, might be relevant to the work that you do with um, nursing home residents, and some of you work with um, assisted living residents as well. Um, yes, it's absolutely true that um, there is a lot of money to be taken out of the Medicare program um, through the health care reform legislation, um, over $400 billion over a 10-year period. But you have to look at how that money is taken out of Medicare to understand it's not quite as dramatic as um, opponents of health care reform would make it seem. What really happens is that this legislation slows the rate of growth um, under Medicare by 1% over the t um, next 10 years. So it still provides for growth in Medicare expenses, um, and what will happen is Medicare, instead of growing at a 6.8% growth rate, will grow at a 5.8% growth rate. Um, if that's not enough of a diminution of the growth rate to be the death knell of Medicare. In fact, it still provides for 
efficient growth in the Medicare program. Um, the big important thing to know is that by slowing the um, growth of Medicare and by eliminating some of the wasteful payments that we will talk about, um, we extend the lifespan of the Medicare trust fund. Um, you generally have heard reports that Medicare is going bankrupt. When they talk about that, they mean the hospital trust fund, which is Part A, um, which was projected to um, uh, become insolvent by 2017. It's now projected that health care reform will extend the life of the trust fund till about 2026 or for nine years. The other thing to know is that by making a lot of these changes, um, there will be a slowing of the growth rate of the Part D, as in boy, premium. Um, that's the part of Medicare that pays for um, doctor's visits. Um, and so that is really beneficial to um, Medicare beneficiaries as well. Um, one of the biggest cuts comes from the um, Medicare Advantage programs, and I want to take a little bit of time to talk about Medicare Advantage programs. These are the um, private insurance plans, the HMOs, the PPOs, the private fee for service plans, and um, the SNP special needs plans, or SNPs. Um, that contract with Medicare to provide um, traditional Medicare services um, in a different manner. And over the past number of years, the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, or MedPAC, which is a private quasi-governmental agency, has determined that these plans are paid on average 13% more per enrollee than it would cost to provide them comparable coverage under traditional Medicare. So if I were a Medicare beneficiary in Washington, D.C., Medicare on average would be paying $100 for my care, but if I were in a Medicare Advantage plan, Medicare would be paying on average about $113 to provide me with the same kind of care. Um, these subsidies cost over $11 billion in um, 2009 alone, um, and they really have hastened the um, uh, insolvency of the Medicare program, and they've actually caused Medicare Part D premiums to increase um, each year for beneficiaries, um, and beneficiaries overall are paying about $90 more each year um, in additional Part D premiums that subsidize these private Medicare Advantage plans. Um, these Medicare Advantage plans are supposed to provide the same benefits as traditional Medicare, but what many of them do is they um, offer actuarially equivalent cost sharing. That means that they charge lower cost sharing for some services than for other services, and they um, lower than traditional Medicare, and they often charge higher cost sharing for um, more expensive services. From your point of view, um, you probably know that um, many Medicare Advantage plans charge higher cost sharing for um, skilled nursing facility care than is required under um, traditional Medicare. Um, as you know, under traditional Medicare, if you're in a Part A um, skilled nursing facility stay, there is no cost sharing for the first 20 days. Many of the Medicare Advantage plans will, in fact, impose a daily cost sharing for those first 20 days. And many of them won't certify any more um, than 20 days for um, a skilled nursing facility care. So not only are they charging people more, but um, they are providing them with, with less coverage. Um, so um, about a $170 billion, uh, excuse me, $150 billion of the cuts come from the Medicare Advantage plans. Um, this is really a reduction in um, um, wasteful spending under the Medicare program. It, it's making payments for services that we don't need. Um, a lot of the other cuts do come, in fact, from cuts to providers. Um, most of the provider organizations have agreed to these cuts, and they're really a slowing of the growth rate. Um, there will be changes to the Medicare reimbursement for skilled nursing facilities. Um, it's interesting, Janet and I were at a meeting yesterday in which a representative from ASA was talking about um, the changes. Um, and the um, second um, health care reform bill, the Reconciliation Act, delays implementation of um, some of the changes in um, reimbursement to skilled nursing facilities. And um, 
it turns out the nursing home trade associations would like to see it all implemented in October. Um, so it's interesting to note that um, they're no longer objecting to the, these changes in um, payment structures. Um, so yes, there will be um, changes in uh, Medicare payments. We have to look to see whether or not there will be changes in access to care for beneficiaries. Um, I'm not sure that there will be. Um, the big issue will be whether or not um, Medicare Advantage plans will continue to um, serve Medicare markets as extensively um, as they do now. Um, but the thing to note about Medicare Advantage plans is that even without the changes in the payment structure, they have a yearly contract with Medicare, and they do make decisions on a yearly basis whether or not to continue serving Medicare populations. And they do, in fact, change the benefit structures and the cost sharing that they offer to Medicare Advantage plans that, um, enrollees. The other thing to remember is that regardless of what happens, um, there is no change to the um, traditional Medicare benefit package. Um, so the items that are covered under Medicare today will be covered um, tomorrow and will be covered after health care reform is implemented. Um, people who lose their Medicare Advantage plans will be always covered by um, traditional Medicare, so they are not losing any Medicare benefits at all. Um, there are some good provisions in um, health care reform that you should all know about. Um, I'm sure you've all heard about closing of the donut hole. Um, that's going to be um, an improvement for many Medicare beneficiaries. It may not necessarily help um, people who live in long-term care facilities. Many people in long-term care facilities don't have a donut hole because they're eligible for the Part D low-income subsidy, or also known as extra help, that um, pays for cost sharing and co-payments um, for nursing home residents. Uh, but for um, people who live in the community and people who um, aren't eligible for the low-income subsidy, this is going to be a very big improvement. Another big improvement will be the fact that um, health care reform eliminates cost sharing for preventive services. And um, starting next year in 2011, the, um, uh, all Medicare beneficiaries will be entitled to an annual physical exam. Um, there has never really been Medicare coverage for physical exams, you know, annual checkups. Um, several years ago, Congress implemented a Welcome to Medicare um, annual exam, which you were eligible to receive one time when you first became a Medicare beneficiary. Now Medicare beneficiaries will be able to get um, their annual exam covered. Um, another benefit to Medicare beneficiaries will be some of the changes in uh, system delivery design. These changes will um, help in the coordination of care for um, many beneficiaries. Um, there are provisions that will help reduce unnecessary hospitalizations and rehospitalizations, which um, will really be useful for your client populations. There will also be demonstrations involving bundling of payments to um, effectuate coordination of care. Um, bundled payments may incorporate payments to hospitals, nursing homes, and um, home health agencies, for example, to make sure that people get the appropriate mix of services. So you may want to watch for those um, as well. There are um, some provisions to improve um, the benefits offered by Medicare Advantage plans. One of the provisions that's pertinent to your population is that starting in 2011, uh, Medicare Advantage plans can't impose cost sharing for certain services that are um, uh, high cost services, and they can't impose cost sharing that's higher than traditional Medicare for those services, um, and the statute specifically names skilled nursing facility care as one of the services for which they can't impose higher cost sharing. There um, are also um, issues um, that might be um, relevant to um, some of the populations that you serve. 
Um, for those of you who um, also work with um, people who are living in assisted living facilities under waiver programs, you know that some of those people have problems paying the cost sharing for their prescription drugs. If those folks were living in a nursing home and they were on um, Medicaid, they wouldn't have to pay any cost sharing under Part D. But because they're living in the community and they require a skilled level of care, they still have to pay the minimal cost sharing that's required of people who are um, um, on the low-income subsidy program. And for somebody who's got, you know, 10 drugs with the copayment of, um, you know, two or three dollars or even six dollars for a drug, they may not have enough money to pay for all those drugs out of their personal needs allowance. Um, starting in 2012, people who are um, living in the community under a waiver program won't have to pay any cost sharing for um, their Part D drugs as long as they really need a skilled level of care. The other provision that might be useful and of interest to all of you is a provision to prevent the um, waste wasteful dispensing of outpatient drugs, of Part D drugs in long-term care facilities. Um, and starting in 2012, prescription drug plans must use um, dispensing techniques for Part D covered drugs um, that um, are um, designed not to um, promote waste. So these could be weekly, daily, or automated dose dispensing um, techniques. Um, and CMS is supposed to um, come up with guidance on what those techniques will be. Um, and they're supposed to um, consult with relevant stakeholders, including nursing home residents and their representatives. So um, as ombudsman, you might want to um, provide, um, when the opportunity comes, you might want to provide CMS with some input on um, what would be good uniform dispensing techniques for um, the residents with whom you do work. Um, there are other um, prescription drug um, benefits. Um, there are going to be um, uh, improved formulary requirements. Um, we know at the moment that um, CMS um, has designated um, six protected classes of drugs which um, all or substantially all of which must be included on the formulary of all um, um, prescription drug plans. Um, this uh, provision, PIPACA, um, refines how CMS determines what those um, uh, drugs are and um, what kind of utilization management requirements will be attached to those drugs. Um, utilization management requirements are things like requiring you try another drug first or limiting the quantities of um, um, uh, drugs that, that you might um, get. Um, I'm looking at the time, and I think I'm going to, to stop there. The takeaway point um, again, is under Medicare is that, yes, there are going to be budget cuts, but the cuts really slow the growth um, in payments to providers. A good chunk of the cuts come from um, eliminating waste and fraud payments. There will be provisions that will um, increase the coordination of care, reduce unnecessary hospitalization, provide higher quality care for um, doctor services, skilled nursing facility services, um, of Medicare Advantage services, um, and generally improve the care that beneficiaries receive. Um, I guess at that point, I'm going to turn it over to Lori again um, for questions. Great. Thanks so much, Vicki, and thanks to all of you for your very informative presentations this afternoon. As those of you who are listening can see, this bill was enormous with just a ton of different pieces of legislation that were wrapped into it that affect a whole range of issues that you're all dealing with. And frankly, we're just thankful that experts like these are the ones who've been tracking all of uh, the different pieces of legislation. We do have a few minutes for questions, and Sarah, who's our operator today, will instruct you how to queue up um, to ask some questions. Sarah? Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, if you would like to register a question, please press a 1 followed by the four on your telephone. You'll hear a three-tone prompt to acknowledge your request. 
If your question has been answered and you would like to withdraw your registration, please press the 1 followed by the 3. And as a reminder, if you're using a speakerphone, please lift your handset before entering your request. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, that's a 1 followed by the 4 on your telephone to register for a question. One moment, please. While we're waiting for the first question, I'd like to remind you all that information on these different pieces of legislation and what the different presenters talked about today um, can be found on various websites. As Janet mentioned, um, Nickner has been posting some information on its website. The National Senior Citizens Law Center has been doing the same, as has the Center for Medicare Advocacy. Um, so you can get additional information on those sites. Do we have a first question? Yes, we do. And our first question comes from the line of John McDermott. Please proceed. Hi, John. Hi. Um, just a real quick question about the um, state balancing incentive program, um, because the timing is very interesting. Yesterday, we had a woman call who was in a nursing home. Previously, she was out in the community in what we call the community care family foster home. And she told me that Medicaid is now telling her here in Hawaii that um, she needs to go back into uh, a foster home because they've decided that her intermediate care level is not very strong and that she can get what she needs out in the community. And I'm just wondering, with the timing here, um, if our state is trying to increase their Medicaid reimbursement by raiding the nursing homes and, and pushing people out in the community who maybe don't want to be out in the community. Um, uh, th thanks for that question. Let, let, let me just emphasize that, that with all of these new community-based options available to the Medicaid population, um, they are all at the beneficiary's option to um, accept if they have long-term care needs. What was not affected at all by the Patient Protection Act uh, is the entitlement to coverage for nursing facility services to individuals who meet both the clinical and financial eligibility requirements of the program. But what was done was that there was an expansion of the services available in the community to those individuals who meet those standards. But there was no um, um, uh, similar reduction in the availability of nursing facility coverage uh, for the same population. So um, even, even in the state that's aggressively trying to expand its community-based options, uh, an individual who, uh, again, meets that clinical standard and the financial eligibility requirements must be provided nursing facility coverage by the state. Okay. so. Um is it in writing anywhere that a, a resident can say, I actually prefer to stay in the nursing home? Um, it's, well, the, the, the federal law makes nursing facility coverage an entitlement. That, that's, that's all the individual needs. If the individual is, if, the, if someone is trying to get the individual out of the nursing facility, there are, of course, as you know, uh, protections a, a, against that. But it, it, it basically sounds to me as if what this person is being told is that they no longer meet the state Medicaid clinical eligibility standard for nursing facility coverage. And that is something that the individual can challenge through the appeal process. Uh, but, but in the absence of, of a determination by the state agency that the individual does not meet that standard, uh, there's a certainly no basis for Medicaid telling the individual that the individual has to exit the facility. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, and, and feel free to um, uh, follow up with me on that if, if, you, if you need any more direction on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. John. Is there another question? There are currently no further questions from the phone lines. And actually, we did have another question just queue up. It comes from the line of Esther Hauser. Please proceed. Hi, Esther. Uh, well, okay, I'm on a speakerphone. Just a second. Hello. Hello. Uh, okay. Uh, my question, I thought someone else might ans ask this. <clears throat> Since so many of the states are in the budget crunch business, um, is there any more detail in the availability of ombudsman funding by, it says, you know, the law says by grant, 
or uh, and I, I just don't know whether that's going to be the normal through AOA process of um, access to the resources by the states or whether there's the, the expectation that it will be some sort of special grant process. Brian, do you have any idea how that will work or thoughts about that? Um, we're, we're really not sure. Um, the, um, there's some discussion around that going on, but um, I'd just say a lot of the funds related to Elder Justice Act um, will be HHS, and we're not sure if the Secretary will designate um, the Administration on Aging to handle those. The, you know, the, big, the biggest question mark is probably, um, um, you know, where the biggest funding is, really, and that's um, Adult Protective Services. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we really, the, um, there's been some discussion around that, but the folks who um, care about, the, you know, the APS folks themselves, um, during the course of authorization, for example, uh, or development of the bill and then creation of this authorization over the years have not been um, gung-ho about having the Administration on Aging um, have any um, control over additional resources. So we, we really mm -hmm. don't know. The Ombudsman funds, um, it's much more likely that um, those that funding process could go through the Administration on Aging because that's historically where um, ombudsman funds generally have come mm -hmm. from, although we've gotten some um, additional funds, as you know, from CMS over the years and, and such, um, and Medicaid dollars. Okay. Can I further ask, um, you'd indicated that, well, I, I wasn't clear from the, from the summaries I'd seen whether the $32.5 million dollars for the long-term care ombudsman program, how many years that was spread out over? I thought I heard you say something about 2011 funding levels of $5 million uh, for the ombudsman program and $10 million for the resource center or yeah. training. It's not as specific as the resource center. Um, at that point, I was referring to that I, I felt like our programs and the resource center would be a good in a good position to compete for those funds, mm -hmm. but very specifically, um, the um, the the, uh, the grants are um, for support of the long term care ombudsman program are five million for 2011, seven point five for 2012, ten for um, 2013, and um, ten million also for 2014. Oh, okay. um, the, the, the grants that would support, um, <clears throat> and again, this is um, uh, potentially through the secretary, to establish programs to provide, improve, um, provide and improve ombudsman training related to elder abuse, um, those are $10 million each for um, FY 2011 through FY 2014. Mm -hmm. Those funds, um, I think it's safe to say that the center would be a natural organization to apply for those funds mm -hmm. um, to create or establish or improve training for ombudsmen. Um, NASOP could apply for some of those funds. Others mm -hmm. could apply. So we don't really know how that will play out um, within right. HHS slash the Administration on Aging if they take um, that role as well. Mm -hmm. And of course, you've got other grant programs um, right. that would go to training surveyors and um, working in nursing homes and such. So in mm -hmm. theory, HHS could say, oh, put out an RFP with, I'm making this up, so mm -hmm. just so you understand mm -hmm. that, Esther. But mm -hmm. in theory, they could put it out an RFP with, you know, eight categories of resources and you would, in one, in an organization, or a specific um, program would decide which ones they might apply for. Um, they also could do it differently and have some monies go out like that with an RFP and some monies be 
um, divide it up between um, states to do mm-hmm. um, ombudsman right. services. Right. So it's 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 really um, uh, very unclear right now. Okay, I just you know let me just I make sure driving for any yeah. clarity. Yeah, Janet, do you do you agree with that? I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't think we ever uh, sort of got past uh, trying to get the bill passed to thinking how it would be implemented. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, but good going on getting any money, even though it, whether or not we have to compete for it. I'm, I'm delighted. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ms. Matenka, there are no further questions at this time, so I'll now turn the call back over to you. Okay. Thanks so much. We're coming to the close of our time today, so I know there was a lot to process and a lot of information that was shared. If you do have additional questions, um, you can direct them here to the center um, or to any of the speakers, and we'll uh, try to get them answered for you. And as I mentioned earlier on in the call, this is really the first step um, with this enormous piece of legislation and the different provisions that were included in it. It's going to take quite a while to get all of the different pieces sorted out. Um, and as Brian was saying, to figure out how things are going to work, how they're going to be implemented, even what the timelines are going to be. Um, And so it looks like we've all got a lot of work ahead of us, um, and and we'll just get working on that. Um, We will be planning future additional opportunities to share information and resources. Um, Keep checking our websites um, and keep directing your questions to us. I'd like to thank our presenters today, Janet, Brian, Vicki, and Jean for taking the time um, to share the information and and your expertise with the callers today. It was so beneficial and helpful. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, And uh, with that, we'll close the call for today and uh, look forward to talking to you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the conference call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your lines.